My mother uh, loved a good movie, especially the Rodgers and Hammerstein musicals, and The Sound of Music was one of her all-time favorites. One of my earliest memories is watching my grandmother read, laugh and cry as we watched it together in downtown Stanton. A uh, very special experience that my mother arranged for us. And it was the first movie, I think, that my grandmother had seen in a theater in many, many years. And I remember fondly our family's trip to Europe in 1975, where we took a tour of Salzburg, Austria. And, and finally, I remember the, the great thrill that mom felt when she and some college friends had the chance to meet the subject of the sound of music, Maria von Trapp, at her family ski lodge in Vermont in the 1980s. You could easily make a full-length motion picture out of mom's life filled with the stories of the people whose lives she's touched all over the world. And there's no time to describe that movie this afternoon. No, only time to share a few precious snapshots of mom's life on this earth. Mary Lucinda Reed Quinlan was born here in Stanton to Fred and Bessie Reed. My grandfather and his brothers had started a small grocery store together that eventually became a small chain of supermarkets. Both of my grandparents were extremely active in their church and in community organizations. And they took great pride in their four children. My mother's Aunt Lucy, a contemporary of Helen Keller, who taught deaf children in Massachusetts, was also an extremely important role model in mom's life. Mom herself was extremely active as a youth here in her home church, which resonated with her later involvements with every congregation she belonged to in Virginia, Illinois, Wisconsin, and Kansas. Mom attended Randolph-Macon Woman's College in Lynchburg, earning a bachelor's degree in art history. She later went on to earn a master's in elementary education from the University of Virginia and taught school. In 1952, she left for India, where she served for three years as a short-term missionary for the Methodist Church in the north-central India city of Kanpur. She taught at Methodist High School there, at one point becoming its acting principal. She wrote this in 1952 as she was completing uh, training for that task. She wrote, I was raised in a Christian home and grew up in the church but it wasn't until my contact with the Virginia Methodist student movement when I was in college that I came to see the full personality of Christ and the implications of his life and teaching for every phase of our lives. I remained more or less on the receiving end of this very dynamic program for a long time, but in the summer of 1950, I became a member of the Iowa Rural Work Camp. This project was my first interracial experience and has opened up for me the way to many rich friendships since. Last summer, I participated in an ecumenical work camp at Agape, Italy, and I think here it really dawned on me that Christ was actually the Christ of all the world. The need for Christ that I saw in so many people and the difference that was made in the lives of those who knew him made me look for a fuller way in which to serve him. As I enter the Asia 3 program, the Asian Missionary Program, I feel deeply grateful for the rich opportunities of service it offers to young people. Mom's time in India resulted in numerous important lifelong friendships and informed her worldview and mission of service throughout her lifetime. Upon her return from India, Mom enrolled in Garrett Theological Seminary in Evanston, Illinois in 1957, when it was there that she met my father, Robert Quinlan. Although they hadn't known each other then, Dad had served as well as a Methodist missionary in Korea while Mom had been in India. They met and fell in love, and my dad proposed to Mom in a lakeside park just across the way from the beautiful Baha'i Temple in nearby Wilmette. 
It was fitting that they chose for their engagement a place of reverence and respect for all of the world's cultures and religions. For this was a thread that wove itself through both my parents' lives, no matter where we lived. They were married on November 22nd, 1958. And I was born a year and a day later. Dad graduated from Garrett in 1962, and our family moved to Wisconsin, where he began his ministry. Four years later, in 1966, great joy came into our life when my parents adopted my sister, Janet. Mom never finished that second master's degree, but continued her work as a Christian educator in multiple realms. One of the special gifts she brought to small and medium-sized cities throughout Wisconsin was a window on the world's diverse peoples and cultures as shared through her experiences and those of her family and friends doing important work all around the globe, which also included helping to initiate and maintain sister church relationships in Cuba, Zimbabwe, India, and Korea. In 1989, I was given the opportunity to travel back to India with mom. 35 years after her experience as a missionary there. I had the rare privilege to share an adventure as an adult with my mother and to learn in detail the nature of a time and place that had helped to shape her life's work and by extension my own. I think that sometimes mom harbored doubts about the significance of her contributions to this world, which often happened in a context that wasn't always directly connected to conventional measures of academic or vocational achievement and usually went unrecognized. And that's why that trip to India was so wonderful for her. In Kanpur, the principal of the high school where she had taught went into the city and found several dozen people who had been her former students. A wonderful reception in her honor. In Bombay, at the annual meeting of the Indian Christian Art Association, they showered her with flower garlands presented her with an achievement award, presented her with a glorious painting of a rainbow made especially for her by one of the young students she had helped. For mom, that trip was a very special journey, and I'm so glad that she was able to feel in such tangible terms a sense of accomplishment for the difference she'd made in two very distant corners of the world. Mom, in every sense of the word, was one of the best friends you could have. Mom's life was not without struggle, including debilitating bouts with depression and a series of physical challenges that grew worse in recent years. However, when I think of mom, it's not through the lens of these temporary limitations that I'll remember her. Instead, it's the enormous strength and perseverance she showed throughout these struggles and throughout her life. On our trip to India, I remember her seeing her size up an especially daunting climb up a hillside on an island near Bombay, which she'd have to overcome in order to see the ancient religious art at the top. She took in a deep breath, and then she climbed that hill, step by difficult step. And that, in many ways, was a metaphor to me of the strength and determination she brought to so many of the challenges of her life. And if you remember, that's, that's the way that the sound of music ends, with Maria leading her family up a hillside on the path to a better life. And so if you seek to honor my mother's memory, I ask only that you continue to celebrate and value life, to speak out and take action against injustice, to live out relationships filled with the beauty and power of unconditional love. Mom's good friend, the Indian artist Frank Wesley, said it well. Whatever you do, do as fully as you can as an act of devotion to the glory of God. That as much as anything says it all about the life of Mary Lucinda Reed Quinlan. May she rest now in peace with the God whose glory she served so well. Amen. I don't know what I can say after that, but it occurs to me 
that perhaps I can give a tribute to the kind of unstinting, faithful love and friendship that Mary Lou gave throughout her life. I think there aren't many people with the gift of being able to give so completely in their human relationships as Mary Lou did. I've known her, it'll be almost 50 years, it'll be 50 years this summer in July, since we first met. And I don't think there was a single time in my life, although we weren't together a great deal of that time, when I wasn't upheld and encouraged by her supportive, caring, active participation in the things that we were interested in together. She gave me such a, a it seems sometimes an un, a one-sided gift of friendship. She always reached out and gave lavishly, not expecting anything in return. And when John spoke of her feeling sometimes that maybe she hadn't achieved anything, I think I should have put her name on the front of that book because it was her encouragement, and I'm not talking about making a telephone call now and then. She got right into the middle of, of the work that we did to put that book together. She called people all over the United States trying to gather information about this wonderful artist who had touched both of our lives. Constantly, when I was away on the other side of the world, she was here following up on the things that she could do best from this side. In the later years, when she was settled in Wichita, she did this wonderful thing of taking uh, an exhibition. And the year we decided to have a peace exhibition and to include not just Christian art, but the spiritual art of people of various faiths and what they felt their souls were reaching for when they talked about peace was the overwhelmingly the greatest exhibition that we had. We must have had three or four hundred entries and certainly exhibited at least two hundred of them. Mary Lou brought back here about fifty or sixty of those pictures that were most portable and, and arranged for many exhibits, but many, many different times in different places. Um, you can't imagine unless you've ever put up an exhibition what that involved. And that last trip that John described was a recapitulation of one we did in 1955, just before we both left India for the first time. Um, it, it was wonderful to have somebody say to me, I cared enough about what we did together in 1955 that in 1989, I want to do it again. She, she, you, you speak of her affirmation of, of her India interest and all, but this is, she affirmed me too that what we did together was important. Her enduring friendship through the years is a gift that I wish we could all learn to be willing to, to everybody that comes our way. She certainly gave it to me, and it's my feeling that she gave it to many other people, too. In India, this is the, this is the symbol. Don't get up on the bullock cart and crack the whip and get the bullocks going. Get down here and put your shoulder to the yoke with me on the other side. That's the kind of encouragement, Mary Lou Gay. She was there, right there with you, with me at least. The kind of friendship that acts as well as speaks. Um, I wish for all of us to know the kind of love and friendship that gives so heartily, and to know that if we too can give that to others, having learned perhaps from Mary Lou how to do it, that our lives will be enriched, as I'm sure she now knows 
her life was. Thank you.